I had been talking to Rose and some other people about a, a project that I will relate to you now and the fact that a um, series of circumstances I ended up with this collection that was created by a woman by the name of uh, Teresa Potter. Teresa Potter, who's she? Batista De Anza, who's he? Uh, any relation to the De Anza Hotel in uh, East Central in Albuquerque? And I said, eh, yes, actually. De in fact, that's the only thing in the entire state of New Mexico that is that does honor him. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Well, I um, had these pictures of this painting collection in storage. Well, since about 1904, uh, 2004, 1904, 2004. <laughs> um, so this past year, I made an effort to get them out, get them hung here in where I normally hang my collection of Native American art, and then get photographed, uh, and and do some publicity. Uh, we got the name of every single place in California that that has De Anza in the name. De Anza University, De Anza Trails Association, Friends of De Anza, uh, and it just goes on and on and on. About 20 or 25 different organizations, mostly in California, but there's also the De Anza Trail Association in Arizona. Um, I made up a packet. It had some pictures in it, a little brief uh, background. I then mailed it to most of these places that told me where it is. And then um, about a month later, the envelope comes back saying, sorry, uh, not no known address for this or something. So then I'd get in the habit of calling them and say, oh, yeah, we moved a couple of years ago. And so I'd send it to them again and everything. But for whatever reason or reasons, I have not received any uh, responses at all, not even a trickle. So um, I'm in the process of thinking about in the process of putting them all back in the, the crates that they had come in. But before I did that, I was talking to the road that said, maybe we could have an open house if you want. Some of the local people would like to see a collection that um, had been shown at the Navajo Tribal Museum, only because I and Teresa Potter were very good friends, and so it came up there. But for the most part, this uh, collection of 15 paintings toured Arizona and California up until 18, here I go again, 1985, 10 years after uh, the bicentennial, or, or eight years, and they were still going on tour. Uh, the last place was some bank in Sacramento. Um, let me let me digress and tell you a little bit about Teresa Potter because uh, I really feel that she was a, a very exceptional person. There's a picture of her right here with uh, with um, I can't even remember his name. Um, Jonathan Winters and Peter Marshall, They're both uh, movie movie stars from that time period. Uh, Teresa was born in 1933 in uh, Alvin, St. Albans in, in Vermont. When she was 19 years old, and this doesn't happen to any 19-year-old that I've ever heard of, but she came down with a horrible um, case of arthritis. And an arthritis that stayed with her the rest of her life. As you can see in this picture, she's on crutches. Uh, she, she, her hands could never be, I mean, even, even a doctor trying to, trying to straighten them out, uh, the pain was so much. Her hands were like this. And she painted with a, 
with a uh, paintbrush in between these fingers, not like this, but, but like this, sitting on a specially made stool because her knees had long ago completely deteriorated. Uh, but she was one of the most positive people. I have always had a laugh, always had a joke. Uh, she was living with her mother uh, and a boyfriend. <clears throat> and she eventually moved to Phoenix along with her mother. And she really got to painting horses. She loved horses and cowboys and all this sort of stuff. Um, the United States in general under Ford celebrated what we call a bicentennial era because it was both uh, 1775 and 1776. It was the beginnings of the Revolutionary War, the ringing of the Liberty Bell and all these sort of things going on all back east. But every state uh, uh, was expected to at least come up with some activities and events to co-celebrate that, that time period. Well, Arizona and California both went one step further because in 1775, September 29th to be exact, a um, frontiersman who had the same name as his father, Juan Batista de Anza. Father was Juan Batista de Anza. He was Juan Batista de Anza Segundo. Um, and led a, a group of colonists on an 800 mile trek from uh, Hortacitas all the way up to San Francisco. The whole idea of the expedition was to thwart the southern movement of Russia. Russia had now pretty well colonized the Columbia River. The British went in very specifically in 1770, uh, no, in, uh, in uh, 1792. And uh, which was a centennial of, or bicentennial or whatever of Christopher Columbus and named it the Columbia River because it had a Russian name. And so the, it's amazing that when you get into it, how much the uh, friction and everything there was between England as a kind of a third party, but between Spain and Russia <coughs> all along the Western coast. In fact, right after the Civil War, we bought Alaska from Russia. And, but at this time, uh, Russian trade uh, enterprises are all the way down uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, can uh, the, the Canadian border and down into Oregon and California. So uh, the purpose of here was then to to augment the fledgling uh, missionary effort. There were only missions at uh, San Diego, San Gabriel, Santa Barbara, uh, and the one that uh, Father Sarah is, is in. None of them had colonies. They were only uh, maintained by a small presidio of, of soldiers and a number of Franciscans. And um, they weren't getting along too well with the natives. Uh, uh, the natives said, boy, you get baptized a Christian and spend the rest of my life making adobe bricks uh, for these magnificent uh, missions as though they wasn't really in their, in their liking. So De Anza, in 1774, went up from Tubac to Tucson, both were just missions. Well, Tubac was a presidio. Tucson was just a mission. Up to the uh, Gila River, followed the Gila River over to where Yuma is today. 
where it starts to broaden out, gets out of kind of a canyon confines, broadens out so that it's not that deep. And you could cross it and go across the Imperial Valley and up through uh, uh, Borrego uh, Park, State Park, and into uh, San Gabriel Mission, which was not uh, the mission that we know of that we recognize it as today with the big arches and that sort of thing. It was still uh, just a you know, uh, wattle and daub uh, series of structures. But he showed that you could, you could get across this desert of Southern Arizona. And for a long time, even as thereafter, it became known as the Devil's Highway. He went back, got permission from the Viceroy, enlisted 28 soldiers, all of whom had to be married, bring their families along. So he ended up bringing, starting out anyway, with 204 colonists. Um, interestingly enough, uh, eight of those women were pregnant. And so during the course of this expedition, the, the group grew from 204 to 210. Uh, one, one, one child died of uh, uh, premature birth. But it's the only major expedition in, this, in a Southwest Spanish or English or French or whatever that actually gained uh, numbers instead of losing numbers during the 800 miles that they're, they're trekking. Uh, when they got to San G uh, Gabriel in the spring, they left. Of course, they didn't want to go across the Imperial Valley, and that's where I'm from. So, uh, uh, and again, the only thing that we have in Calexico, I'm from Brawley, uh, is a De Anza Hotel. Uh, and then they put out a big De Anza uh, festival every year in September to commemorate this, uh, the, this uh, expedition. But um, <clears throat> when they got to San Gabriel, they rested a little bit while De Anza and the soldiers went down to San Diego. Uh, the natives there had just killed all of the Franciscans and some of the soldiers. And so they brought in more Franciscans and, um, and then went back up. And then De, uh, De Anza went ahead of the group. They went up to Monterey. Uh, the whole group, and then just a small selection. Um, uh, his assistant and um, Joaquin Moranza, I never can remember his last name, Maraca. Um, up to the Bay of San Francisco, they laid out specifically where the mission is going to go, where the Presidio would, would go, and then also where the colony would, would go. And so they're looking for the colony, they're looking for places where they could grow orchards and, and then also develop a harbor because there were ships just off uh, offshore waiting for them to say land here and they uh, had uh, additional supplies for them. So then um, under his second in command's uh, tutelage, the, the entire, uh, Group came up, settled down, started building the church, uh, Mission Dolores, and um, the Presidio. The Presidio is still there, right underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. And <clears throat> uh, by now it's uh, midway through 76. Uh, he goes eight, almost a thousand miles, 800 miles back, and then he goes another 200 miles to get to Mexico City to make his report. And the viceroy is very happy that everything, or at least when I left, it was doing okay. And um, uh, said, are you now uh, ready for your next assignment? Well, I was kind of hoping to rest a little bit. <laughs> he said, no, I, I need to, I have a vacancy and I need you to fill it right now. This is 1777. And all oh, what's that? He says, the governorship of the Provincia de Nuevo Mexico. And your new headquarters will be in a place called Santa Fe. And so he went another 
it's almost a thousand miles from Mexico City to take over as governor of New Mexico. And he was the governor of New Mexico from 1777 until 1788. And um, he started getting stomach pains and they were really, really hurting. He couldn't even ride back. So they rigged up a um, carreta uh, with some blankets and everything to kind of soften the trip and took him back down to Hortocitas. And um, uh, he got home probably the end of August or so. It was almost as uh, uh, September was coming up. And two weeks after he got home, he died. And he's buried in the in the chapel or the church there, um, and um, in 1976, just to make sure, because all everything said he, that's where he's buried, they dug him up, and he was there. He was, uh, so they covered him all back up again, and so now when somebody says, "I wonder where De Anza is buried," or well, we know where he's buried. In 1975 and 76, Arizona decided not only to celebrate its bicentennial of the Liberty Bell and everything that happened back in Philadelphia, but also to happen here, uh, uh, this episode. So here's a good article in uh, Arizona Highways uh, about. Anza comes again, and they made, a, with exact numbers, 204 visitors and 28 soldiers and all the officers and a couple hundred horses and that sort of thing. And they retraced, actually from the border, just at New Gallus, up to, uh, uh, to uh, Tubac, Tucson, over to Colorado, uh, Yuma and the Colorado River, and then uh, another group from California, uh, picked up was they left off then. So it was reenacted then during that time period. Teresa and all of her handicaps of the not being able to walk or anything actually rode a horse. Because it's easier to ride a horse than walking with, with canes. So she went with this expedition. She made sketches every time, every time they stopped for maybe a, a historical event or something like that. She sketched all the uniforms, she sketched what the, what the families, the, the, the pioneer or the, uh, uh, that was the pioneers were wearing, um, the accoutrements, the type of saddles, the type of weapons, everything. And then he uh, came back and when she came back, uh, I had uh, touched base with her a year earlier when I was down in Phoenix trying to raise money for the Navajo Code Talkers to march in the 1976 uh, Rose Bowl parade. And so uh, she responded to a fundraising drive we were having in Phoenix and we got to be good friends, good acquaintances. And so she spent the next year, she got, uh, uh, some funding from the Arizona Bicentennial Commission. They uh, at least paid for the frames, and, and, uh, and the frames are no cheap thing. They're very, if any of you ever got, sometimes you can spend more money on a frame than you do on, on the picture. And 15 frames that all look alike. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, Following year, then in 1778, 79, it started to go on um, tour. And the very first place that she showed was the bank in Phoenix that had pretty well underwritten her, or at least kept her going while she was doing the paintings. And the second place that she showed the paintings was the Navajo Tribal Museum out at Winter Rock. So I dressed most of my staff. I, we had some Spanish colonial conquistador outfits and everything. So I had all these Navajos running around in conquistador outfits all that uh, 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 that day, welcoming everybody and to see this uh, 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 
uh, exhibit of the 15 paintings of the uh, De Anza expedition. And we ended up with about 300 people that day. More Navajos were interested in it, obviously, than the, uh, <laughs> sometimes when you try to get people here to Gallup interested in something. But, um, and Teresa was there. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, so when, then I went back about a year or so later, it came back and it was shown at Rancho de los Codendrinos for about two weeks as well. And it's about the only two places south in, in New Mexico where the uh, collection was shown. Once it got into California, it just went and went and went. And um, the last the, the last time I think that uh, it was scheduled was at a bank in Sacramento in, uh, <clears throat> in 1985. So this is about eight years after it first started going on, on the tour. Um, they sent it back to Arizona and the Bicentennial Commission had um, disbanded six years before this. So there was nobody except for Teresa herself to turn the, the paintings back to. Uh, in the following year, in 86, I got a call from her one day and said, uh, Martin, I just want a, a second opinion. I said, the doctors here in Phoenix have told me that there's now a brand new system of uh, technology in terms of operations where they could replace a hip or replace a knee or something that's badly damaged from whatever. Both of my knees have been so wiped out and there's constant pain and they want to replace one of my knees. And if it works, then replace the other knee and I will actually be able to walk without crutches again. But I'm just really uh, apprehensive about it because it's a fairly new procedure. I said, all I can say is my, our friend, Carl Gorman, Navajo code talker, just had his hip replaced a couple months ago, and he's out playing tennis. So um, uh, and it worked for him. He said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. A week ago, a week later, I got the bad news. And apparently it happened all too often with people that were being operated on with that procedure at that time. She had the operation. It was a, a tremendous success. The, the kneecap fit and everything. And um, uh, she woke up. They put her in a recovery bed. Uh, people are visiting her. She could actually even kind of still uh, at that early stage even bend her leg at the knee. She's laying in bed talking to her mother. And apparently what didn't happen a lot of times but did happen on occasion. Now they filter the blood for 24 hours after an operation like that, but they didn't at that time. A blood clot formed in her knee. Within a minute or so, it was in her heart. In mid-sentence, she's talking to her mother. She's dead. And um, so there wasn't at least any pain or anything, but it was, Teresa was gone. Um, she had been a fantastic uh, painter. She's the only female that ever got inducted into the uh, cowboy artists of the West. And where they usually limited their number to 24, when one dropped out or died or moved away or something, then they would bring in another one. They? And she was the only female that in for several years, uh, they, uh, uh, she was listed as a, a member of the uh, <clears throat> of that uh, of that organization. Um, so her boyfriend ended up with the collection in two thousand three. Uh, I'm trying to think. It was Drake is his last name? 
calls me on the phone. He's now got a new girlfriend. He's living in Coyote, which is a little bit uh, oh, 50 miles east or so of Santa Fe, up, back up in the uh, up near the Rio Grande. He and his girlfriend are in the process of moving to Seattle, Washington. And they still have this collection of Teresa's. And would I be interested in buying it? And I said, well, I know what it's worth because all the time that it was on the trip, it was, it was appraised and insured for $100,000. And, um, and I said, I, I don't have any $100,000 or even, he says, all I need is a little over $4,000 to make the move. And I can't, I, I'm on a little trailer, got a lot of stuff, and I really don't see where I have any use for this collection. Well, I'll think it over. I, I knew I had that much in my savings account, but what am I going to do with the collection? Well, I thought he was calling from Coyote. He wasn't. He was on his cell phone, and he was just up the street a ways. Because about 15 minutes later, he pulls up in the driveway in his pickup truck with the whole collection. He says, have you made up your mind yet? What the hell are you doing here? <laughs> he says, well, uh, I didn't call from Coyote. I, I, I was so sure that you would buy it and help me out. Uh, I, uh, I just called you when I was in it was Jamestown or someplace like that. So anyway, I went to the bank and got it out. And then uh, we got Bob Roseburg. That is why I was hoping that Bob would be here tonight. Because then uh, we went over to Bob's house and, and he uh, filled out a form that formulated a bill of sale and that sort of thing. And um, uh, Drake is his last name. Anyway, he signed it and I signed it and I gave him the money. And uh, so we came back here and unloaded the, the paintings, and he just had them in cardboard boxes and everything. In fact, if you came through the front door, <laughs> you would have seen a lot of cardboard boxes off to one side, and that's where all these paintings are going to go back into. Anyway, uh, uh, about November or December, uh, last Christ around Christmas time, I decided that uh, I... I, at my age and all the stuff I got in, in this house and in storage and every place else, I needed to start downloading. And uh, might be a good time to see if what I could do with, with the De Anza expedition. I don't want to. I didn't then. I still don't want to sell it piece by piece or painting by painting. I want to sell the whole thing. Um, this is the, the painting that I bought from Teresa a couple of years ago. It's always hung in my dining room. If people have come and gone in my dining room over the years, this is hanging up. The, it has a lot of orange in it. And orange is in my dining room. And I paid her 2000 for that. And so I figured I, if I put two, uh, just a flat 2000 on every one of these paintings, even the big ones like this, uh, and the frames are, uh, are really... Uh, fantastic and the matting i was only a little uh, bit of damage on one matting a little like a coffee stain or something and it's on the matting not on the not on the painting uh the paintings are all in in tremendously good good condition so um, i i went to the joint session of the new mexico and arizona historical societies and flagstaff and uh, put together a pamphlet uh, to sell these articles. Actually had a lot of uh, people from the De Anza Trail Association, I even got their cards and everything, that they would like to, uh, to really bid on them or something. I said, I'm going to start at 3,000, uh, either go up or negotiate down or something, but at least respond. And I would like to hear from People and I went through uh, this map. Uh, on the back of this thing is about 50 different organizations in California, 48 to be exact, 
that are De Anza of some sort, De Anza University, De Anza National Park, De Anza Trails National Park, uh, De Anza this, De Anza that, De Anza this. I sent a packet to all of them. A couple of them I got back say that the address had changed. And, um, and I thought at least maybe one would uh, respond. But as of August 31st, there's been no response whatsoever. So they go back in the boxes. Uh, maybe I'll get a response. They really, in fact, I've had some people from New Mexico show an interest in them, but it's really not an expedition that had anything to do with New Mexico. Um, I find it interesting, and I was involved in it uh, when, they, when we celebrated uh, the bicentennial of it, that um, uh, in 76, in 1776, the word already got up to Santa Fe that San Francisco had just been established. And so the governor at that time, the predecessor before uh, uh, De Anza, wanted to develop an overland route from Santa Fe directly over to to uh, San Francisco. And he assigned two Franciscans, Dominguez and Escalante, uh, to uh, and a map maker uh, to, to f lay out that trail. And they were not successful in doing it. Uh, they kept going, running into the Grand Canyon, and they would go north and they'd run into some other, the Green River, or they ended almost up to uh, all the way to. Uh, Salt Lake City before they finally got around the mountains and off into a basin. In late September, when it was kind of getting wintry, they were going down through the Utah Basin and they could see the Sierra Nevada mountains off to the west. And they saw a, a very a dip in a, a pass. And so they took a vote whether to continue on and go through that pass or say the heck with it and go back to, try to get back to Santa Fe. So they brought two straws, one about this long, one about twice as long. And Dominguez held both of the straws so only the tips showed. And Escalante then drew. If he drew the long straw, they would go over the pass and keep going. He drew the short straw which means that they went home. That was in 1776. In 1846, not too many years afterwards, a group of Americans saw that same pass and went through it. We call it Donner Pass today. And uh, it was a national tragedy. But uh, so God was with them, I guess, when they, when they drew the straw and um, came back through the Hopi country and back to Zulu. Actually, Escalante was the, the head priest uh, at the mission at, at Zuni. And so um, it took a while before they established the Santa Fe Trail. But it was interesting how quickly after the De Anza expedition that uh, Santa Fe reacted and said, we better see if we can connect up with them as well. And uh, that in itself was, uh, I was responsible for the whole part of the reenactment of that, uh, of that one from uh, Lake Powell, the, the crossing of the Fathers, where they crossed the San Juan River uh, and chiseled a, uh, a stairway for the horses, not so much for them. And it's still there today. It's underwater now with Lake Powell. I got a chance to see it before it got underwater. And it's, all, it's on the map. It's called the Crossing of the Fathers. Came out at, at uh, Kaibato Canyon and took that canyon on down until they got to uh, Tuba City, which at that time was a colony of, of Havasupai Indians. Went over to the Hopi and then uh, down to, back down to Zuni. So that's a to get another story. But I, I wanted to let you know a little bit about Teresa. Um, I really felt uh, her signature uh, 
was kind of a rocking, and that was she couldn't rock. Well, she could sit in a rocker and rock, but uh, just T uh, P, and so you'll see her her kind of logo on each uh, of these. And again, always with a, f a smile on her face. And um, it's a shame that she had to go the way she went. And um, I feel I, I, a little guilty because I encouraged her to take the to, to take the operation, and um, and it didn't work out. But um, I want to invite you to uh, maybe replenish your wine or whatever. It normally starts on the, the first painting that's on the tripod in the dining room and goes through. Uh, the horse picture is a little out of place, but it was the smallest picture I could get. I used just nails I already had in the, in the walls, so I didn't add any new nails. Uh, but uh, they're fairly good all the way around. And there's the one there, this one, this one, of course, this main one uh, crossing the... Uh, uh, crossing the Colorado River at, at uh, what is now Yuma, and uh, uh, getting to San Gabriel, and then there's a couple more, and then his his dream, uh, and uh, uh, Teresa kind of shows him dreaming about the Golden Gate Bridge and, and uh, the skyline of San Francisco as we know it now, is he's the, f the father, he's the founder of it. And then he came back and he spent, uh, uh, what, 11 years as, as governor of New Mexico. There's some books here. Uh, what she used is also uh, what I got a set of. Uh, kind of hard to see here. It's uh, Anza's California Expedition. This is just volume one. There are five volumes by Herbert Bolton. And the, the publishing date, 1939. So uh, these books are almost 100 years old. And uh, I paid $1,000 for the uh, five volumes. Because uh, I had promised her... Did they keep journals? Is a lot of that based on journals? Hmm? Is a lot of that based on journals that they kept? Yeah, then? journals and then, and that uh, pretty much uh, the diaries that they kept was unbelievable. So I got five of these. I got a two volume set by one of the priests that went uh, along, and then there's several several books. Uh, again, the uh, Anza conquers the desert and and several others. Uh, I, my only problem is that, but some of these guys were that way. They might have been on this trek for a month, but by God, if I was the commander and I needed to be a role model in front of everybody, I washed my white shirt in the morning or I had somebody do it. And because uh, I, because uh, he was not a in a bedraggled uniform. By the time he got to San Francisco, he's still as fresh as when he left where the <laughs> For the cultures. So um, um, take a look at them. I, I got a couple of other things that um, maybe now, if, if I don't get everybody back, but in a couple of weeks, there's going to be a military convoy. This is more Route 66 than anything. Uh, 90 vehicles are following the, the Route 66. They left Chicago two days ago. Because they've got tanks and they're really in their in their column, and they're going down the freeway, they're going at a top speed of thirty-five miles an hour. They will be in Tucumcari on on September thirtieth, October fourth. They will be in Gallup on the evening of October. I mean, October first, October fourth, Wednesday, October fourth. Uh, they will be spending the night here, and they'll have all the vehicles. Uh, assembled in the uh, parade ground uh, of the real, real west uh, uh, <coughs> facility. So, so if you're into uh, the leader of the group, 
and it's a, the National Military Vehicles Association or something like that, is driving a World War I ambulance. And it's some world, other World War I vehicles in it, a lot of World War II, Korea and Vietnam. So uh, if you see a military caravan coming down, down the road in the first week, and uh, don't think that Trump declared war on uh, <laughs> Or maybe by then he might. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't think he will have declared war, war on North Korea. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, it should be an interesting thing. Also, I wanted to remind everybody that it's community concert series, too. So get your community concert tickets. So if you want to get some more to eat, uh, so really, those, those tomatoes come from somebody's garden. I figured that they didn't taste like store tomatoes. This is the real thing. You can look at it <clears throat> in here. You can kind of see where the uh, better lighting, uh, where the route came. It was 800 miles. They went as far as Lewis and Clark expedition, which took two years to go. And uh, they did it in one year or less than one year. So, uh, uh, and again, this is the poster that she made for the Code Talkers. They made it into a poster and then uh, sold the heck out of it. Uh, they sold almost 5,000 of them over the years. And uh, when I got, I got all, all the Code Talkers that were around at that time, almost all of them are dead now, but I got them all to sign that particular one. But uh, that was her involvement with the Code Talkers. And uh, so, uh, if you got questions, we can uh, move around. Uh, uh, Thank you. I like this one. And you may want to look at some of these. So hopefully you learned a little bit about Southwestern history anyway, if it's not necessarily specifically Gallup history. Mm -hmm. Martin, Mark, where did you say you were from? What, what state? Me? Wisconsin. Yeah, should we start the Oh, so you're now. Uh, John? Jonathan? Yeah. 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 Yeah.